Welcome to the Arlington Street Church podcast. Founded in 1729, Arlington Street continues today as a gathering place for progressive people of faith in the greater Boston area and beyond. We are located at the corner of Arlington and Boylston Streets, across from the Public Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace. The Dalai Lama was raised to believe that the world is flat. The pre-Copernican worldview developed in India and later translated into Tibetan featured at its center a stationary, flat earth. But when His Holiness was a young man, he discovered in the Potala Palace a curious gift left behind by a European explorer of the Himalayas. It was a sextant, a navigational instrument used to take altitudes. No one told him what it was or how to use it, but he began to play with it and astonishingly figured out that the horizon is curved. His Holiness then had the unenviable task of informing his teachers, the High Lamas, that they and possibly the Buddha himself had been wrong. The earth was not flat. Since then, the Dalai Lama has insisted on a kind of healthy skepticism, the willingness to continually examine and test our assumptions and beliefs, When religion and reason clash, he says, we must listen to reason. Thought leadership and communication specialist Tim Ogden writes, it's so important to remain skeptical, to re-examine assumptions, to consider alternatives. If we're going to make progress, we have to be willing to acknowledge and confront our cognitive biases, what we are doing and why, how we are doing it and where, with whom we are working and when. We have to lose the courage of our convictions and be open to being wrong. Remaining skeptical, he continues, doesn't mean that you have to become a cynic, nor does it mean giving up on your core convictions. It just means becoming willing to examine and test those convictions and assumptions and confirming that they are worth holding. Jane Goodall's extraordinary research on a community of chimpanzees in Tanzania revolutionized our understanding of our closest living relatives. Yet she was patronized and dismissed as a young woman in an all-male field. At one point, after she had reported seeing David Greybeard use a tool to get ants to come out of an anthill, tool use being thought to be the exclusive domain of humans, fellow primate scientists said Jane must have taught him to do it. Instead of being infuriated or crushed, she responded with humor. That would have been fabulous if I could have done that, she said. Humor helps. But, she adds, she simply knew she was right, and her critics were wrong. Asked where she found the patience to deal with them, she replies, my mother always taught me that if people don't agree with you, the important thing is to listen to them. But if you've listened to them carefully and you still think you're right, then you must have the courage of your convictions. What I want to say today is that none of us can know where the line is when it comes to entertaining the opposing view to our deeply held beliefs. Maybe being spacious about it enables us to enter into conversation with people with very, very different values from ours. Maybe the willingness to engage with people with whom we are positive are just plain wrong can be an exercise in curiosity, patience, insight, hilarity, 
rather than frustration. Surely a healthy skepticism enhances the chances of an aha moment and further spiritual awakening. But above all, we are called to live by the directives of the moral compass that is set in the bedrock of our souls. I've been thinking about a doctor whose courage and convictions were sorely tested when he was still a young man. Um, I love this, I'm gonna tell you his story. In September of 1989, his phone rang and a woman he did not know began to interrogate him. Are you Dr. George Lombardi? Do you do research in East Africa? Are you considered to be an expert in tropical infections? Would you consider yourself to be an expert in hemorrhagic fevers? Who are you, he asked. The caller identified herself as the representative of a world figure and Nobel laureate, someone who was suspected of having viral hemorrhagic fever. She had gotten his name from a colleague of his who had told her to call Dr. Lombardi. He knows a lot about a lot of weird things. She was calling to ask if he would consult on the case. George found all of this to be highly improbable. He was 32 years old. He had just opened his office. He had no patience. In fact, he says, I remember staring at the phone, willing it to ring. But in 10 minutes, he was patched through to a conference call to speak with two Indian doctors at a small hospital in Calcutta. Their patient was Mother Teresa. After discussing the case for an hour, he hung up, a little dazed. Then the woman called back. They were very impressed by what you had to say. They'd like you to go to Calcutta. I'm making arrangements for you to leave tomorrow afternoon on the Concord. He said, that is impossible. His passport had expired three months earlier. She said, that's a minor detail. Meet me in front of your building tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. George says, as you can probably surmise, I'm somebody who pretty much does what he's told. So at 7 o'clock the next morning, a Sunday, she comes careening down the block in a wood-paneled station wagon with bad shocks. I jump in. The next stop's the passport office at the Rockefeller Center. A State Department official lets us in, takes my picture, and hands me a brand new passport. The next stop is the Indian consulate where the entire staff has arrived in full dress uniform to give me an honor guard procession. Did I say it's a Sunday? The consulate general himself affixes the visa to my passport. He leans in toward me and says, we bestow our blessings on you. The eyes of the world are upon you. It's time to get to the airport. George Lombardi is joined in the station wagon by five sisters of the Missionaries of Charity. Why are they here, he asks. You don't have a confirmed seat on the Concord, the driver tells him. The sisters are going to go up and down the line of ticketed passengers and beg until someone gives up their seat. You can imagine this scene. Arriving at the hospital in Calcutta, Dr. Lombardi is ushered directly into Mother Teresa's room. He examines her. He has no idea what's wrong. He draws blood and does the things infectious disease doctors do. The cultures have to grow. Outside the hospital, 5,000 pilgrims are holding a candlelit prayer vigil. George goes back to his hotel, hoping to get some rest. Absent-mindedly, he turns on the news. There he is, the leading story. Dr. Lombardi entering the hospital. Dr. Lombardi leaving the hospital. The newscaster intones, Dr. Lombardi has come from the United States to attend to Mother Teresa as she inches closer to death. Two days pass, she deteriorates. The Pope's cardiologist is flown in from Rome. 
And then, says George, the most beautiful sight I've ever seen. Tiny, translucent dewdrops on the blood culture plate. This could be a bacterial infection. He tells the assembled medical team and sets his sights on Mother Teresa's pacemaker as the culprit. The Pope's doctor erupts Vesuviously, announcing that Mother Teresa is clearly suffering from malaria. If they could diagnose malaria anywhere, George thinks it would be on the subcontinent. She does not have malaria. The doctors are at a standoff. Mother Teresa worsens. George takes to exiting the hospital through the sea of pilgrims, bolstered by their love and devotion. On the fifth day, at a gathering of the doctors, the young George Lombardi takes the stand of his life and publicly contradicts the Pope's cardiologist. Making an impassioned plea for Mother Teresa's life, he tells them, this is septic shock. It has a bacterial cause. The pacemaker must be removed. The Pope's cardiologist is enraged. He storms the lectern and pounds on it. If you listen to this American upstart, I will not be held responsible. Mother Teresa's Indian doctors confer. We've decided to go with Dr. Lombardi, they say. The Pope's cardiologist exits. George says, let's get that pacemaker out. The Indian doctors have never performed that operation, and they don't intend to start now. Jo George Lombardi banishes the nuns, attending to his patient with a single nurse, and removes the pacemaker box. All that remains is the wire, the wire that has been tethered into place in her right ventricle, the infected wire that is killing her. He twists it and turns it. It has to come out. It will not budge. And in the most surreal moment of his life, Dr. Lombardi finds himself saying a prayer to Mother Teresa for Mother Teresa. The wire lets go. And then very soon, her fever breaks. She wakes up. She is sitting in a chair eating. She is going to survive. The story ends with George returning to the States, occasionally consulting on Mother Teresa's health. She lives for another eight years. Today, sometimes the sisters of the Missionaries of Charity come to see George. They like to see his photos and the news stories from that trip. One young novitiate says to him, Dr. Lombardi, you represent a link to our past. He says, I'm deeply honored by that. And another sister says to him, Dr. Lombardi, in the convent, we think of you as a rock star. <laughs> Beloved spiritual companions, let us cultivate a healthy skepticism, re-examining our assumptions, considering alternatives, confronting our biases. May we be open to being wrong. And may we be spacious and willing, curious and patient, and try to keep our sense of humor. Above all, we are called to live by the directives of a moral compass that is set in the bedrock of our souls. Let us live with the courage of our convictions. Bless your hearts. Amen. Because the world is poor and starving, go with bread. Because the world is filled with fear, go with courage. Because the world is in despair, go with hope. Because the world is living lies, go with truth. Because the world is sick with sorrow, go with joy. 
Because the world is weary of wars, go with peace. Because the world is seldom fair, go with justice. Because the world is under judgment, go with mercy. Because the world will die without it, go with love. The service begins when the service ends. Bless your hearts. Amen. visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace.